for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Glinker and you're watching Sunday Politics London. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Coming up. With the locals done and dusted around the country, we look forward to the European elections later this month. What do the parties have to offer? This week it's the turn of the Lib Dems and UKIP to tell us. And a campaign to create a new town council in Spitalfields and Banglatown is underway. Will it give residents a bigger voice or create an island of privilege in Tower Hamlets? And joining me for the duration of the programme today is Roshanara Ali, the Labour MP for Bethnal Green and Bow, and Bob Blackman, the Conservative MP for Harrow East. Welcome to both of you. And uh, we start the programme again by putting the spotlight back on you and asking you for the one big issue, the thing you're working on at the moment that uh, is really kind of occupying your time. Roshanara. Well, my big issue at the moment is to try and persuade the government to provide the much needed additional funding to make sure that buildings that have the kind of cladding that was found in the Grenfell Tower, uh, there are uh, hundreds of these buildings that need urgent work and the government has committed funding for the social housing tower uh, blocks but nothing for private blocks and people are being lumbered with thousands of pounds of of fees for 24 uh, hour security because it's been two years since the fire and there's no end in sight and we need the government to take action to provide the urgent funding and also get the work done rather than leaving it to leaseholders to go after their freeholders to do it and if that doesn't work they need to legislate. And I have to say Bob this has been going on and on this is a topic we've returned to many times on this Indeed. program 176 private blocks I think 10 of them have had the work done on them to remove this cladding. It's not good enough, is it? It isn't. And I, I think the reality is that the poor leaseholders are the ones that, that seem to be getting lumbered with the bill. Um, well, that's grossly unfair. Uh, I have been pressing the government to, to actually come up with the commitment to provide the funding or to force the freeholders yeah, to actually what, do the work. What reception are you getting? Because we've heard a lot of warm words from ministers, well, even from the Prime Minister herself, because she's been asked about this in PMQs on a number of occasions now, but not much actual well, action. There, there is a big issue around the regulations that existed, the building regulations that existed at the time when this cladding was put on. Uh, I think a lot of freeholders are holding out for the fact that the building regulations at that time permitted this form of cladding to be put on buildings. Um, so not unreasonably. It's, it's kind of hiding behind the legal niceties, it, except, isn't it? Except if they accorded with the building regulations and this was signed off by local authorities, then it's not unreasonable for them to say, well, you've changed the regulations, you've got to fund the, the changes. And I, I think know. that's reasonable. But I think it's outrageous. The, go the Prime Minister committed after the Grenfell fire when people needlessly lost their lives that she would do everything to protect our people. Those were her words. Two years has passed and what we have is uh, a, a government just ignoring the plight of thousands of our constituents in across the country. And, and actually the other thing indeed. is passing the buck on local authorities is not sensible or helpful. What we need and some of these property owners, freeholders are offshore and so the government needs to stand with residents and provide the legal support okay. as well as the funding to get the work done uh, rather than just passing the buck. Indeed. It's been too long. I'm, I'm sure this is, well it is going to be something that we Absolutely. come back to again. Um, Bob, I think you want to talk about rough sleeping. Yes, indeed. I mean, we're a year on from my Homelessness Reduction Act that I piloted through as a private member's bill that uh, was the biggest reform we've had for dealing with homeless people in this country for more than 40 years. Uh, and essentially, the aim is to prevent anyone from being forced to sleep rough. I mean, the scandal that used to exist, whereby 
particularly single homeless people, would go to the local authority and be told, well, very sorry, nothing to do with us, goodbye, go and sleep on a park bench. Are and you if, you're, if you're lucky, you'll, you'll be picked up by so, a homeless charity. I mean, you know, a fantastically ambitious bill, you got it through. Absolutely. But are you frustrated by it, that perhaps it isn't working in the way you wanted it to? Well, there are frustrations. We're, we're, we're a year into the bill being active, and most importantly, only uh, less than six months into the duty to refer. And one of the key points here is that anyone, any public service that comes across anyone that's homeless or threatened with being homeless can refer that individual to the local authority and they must help. Now the good thing is that in the first six months more than 10,000 people across oh. the country have been prevented from becoming homeless. OK, all right. Well, so much to talk about there, but we're going to park that there for now. And uh, this week we are going to begin looking forward to the European elections. And we start by focusing on two parties who couldn't be more further apart on Europe. Uh, first, the Liberal Democrats, who have caused committed Europhiles, who've campaigned long and hard for a people's vote, which they hope would overturn the 2016 referendum. And then UKIP, whose very reason for being is for the UK to leave the European Union. Here's Jerry Thomas with a quick outline of their policies. Some of the key points that underpin the Liberal Democrats' electoral offer. London thrives because it's a European as well as an English city. There is no Brexit deal that is good for London. Every sector, from hospitality to healthcare, from construction to creative industries, benefits from the free movement of people and frictionless trade with our EU friends and partners. Two main challenges for London are directly dependent on EU membership environment and crime. Climate change and air pollution do not stop at national borders and neither do organised crime and human trafficking. UKIP will leave the EU by repealing the 1972 European Communities Act. It opposes a second referendum. UKIP will continue to oppose business unfriendly EU legislation in the European Parliament. UKIP supports reciprocal rights for EU citizens and will end free movement to alleviate housing, pollution and the overcrowding crisis. Well, joining us now is the Lib Dem candidate, Irina von Visa, and Richard Brain, who is standing for UKIP. Welcome to both of you. Um, you. So, Irina, we're going to start with you. Obviously, uh, some good work for the Lib Dems in the uh, local elections. But really, you know, London, Remain City, you guys should be hoping to clean up in these elections. Absolutely, and I think we will. And I will tell you why, Elizabeth. So the first thing is that I've lived in London for 22 years. I'm the mother of a teenage daughter. And um, I know the problems London is facing, of course, um, just to name two, the environment and crime. And I think at the basis is one fundamental policy that Lib Dems have been unequivocally pro uh, proposing for the last two years, and that is to stop Brexit. So we're running on a very clear message. Every vote for the Liberal Democrats is a vote to stop Brexit. London is a remain city. London depends vitally on its membership in the European Union. And that's why I think we will have a very good result in London. Well, the local elections this week, uh, not here in London, um, but uh, it did look as though the Lib Dems were cutting through. But are you concerned with the Euro elections that, you know, Change UK, the new uh, group that's come out of the independent group, um, that they could be stealing some of your votes? Well, I am, of course, sad that the Remain vote is going to be split. There's not just Change UK, of course, there's also the Green Party. I would have liked to see us work together. There were two reasons why we couldn't. The first one is that, of course, the elections were only decided very late in the game. It was too late to run on a joint platform under the European election. So that's, is that the only reason? Because well, no, the way it's not. some people tell it, it's more that sort of your advances were rebuffed. Well, the other reason is UK. that actually we did offer um, to both parties to work together to not oppose each other. Unfortunately, that offer was not accepted. I'm quite sad about this because I'm a Remainer through and through. I want to see one Remain voice. But of course, Liberal Democrats, and based on the amazing success we've had in the local elections, have a track record for opposing Brex Brexit, and I think people know well, that. OK, thank you very much, Irina. Now, Richard, you, you guys are on opposite sides in almost every way, um, but I put it to you as well that it looks like uh, Nigel Farage is going to be sort of rather stealing your thunder. Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, UKIP has campaigned for 25 years, 27 years in fact, 
to get us to this stage. And what isn't talked about very often is uh, how Brexit is going to be a liberating force. We're going to be able to deregulate and we're going to see an, um, a, a subsequent improvement in our economy as a result because freedom, democracy always brings good business. And that's something to look forward to, especially in London, which is the world's number one finance center and has a huge amount to gain when we actually leave. But you and I both know that London has a much higher proportion of Remain voters than other parts of England. So it is a bit more of an uphill battle for you in London, isn't it? It's very difficult in London, but uh, London isn't a country. It's the capital of the United Kingdom. And so it has to go along with the United Kingdom. The majority voted to leave. If we live in a that's democracy, not, then the majority's Richard, vote that's not must, a great message. must be honoured. That's not a great message. Sort of, it almost sounds slightly threatening towards the voters of London. They have to go along with it. If there had been a general election and, let's say, Labour were elected, and three years later the Tories still hadn't handed over power to, to Labour and allowed them to form a government, what kind of situation do you think you would see in this country? It's an absolute disgrace what's happened. It's a disgrace that I'm having to stand in these elections, which are a great waste of taxpayers' money. And uh, it's, it, it, honestly, the, so many people in this country are so angry that our establishment is refusing they, to actually deliver I mean, what they promised in 2016. I think a lot of people would agree that the electorate is kind of broadly speaking quite angry at the moment. But in a, a multicultural city like London, your leader, Gerard Batten, on the record as you know, using phrases like Islam is a, is a death cult, that's not helping you. And for you as a candidate running in these well, elections, that makes things pretty tough. There are major problems in this country with extremism, and it's important that we talk about it. So uh, I don't think uh, there's any problem with talking openly about problems with Islam. Uh, and it's not just in this country, it's all over the world. So I would defend uh, what he said. I think he said the right thing. I think we need to recognize that there is a problem. We need to look at how churches are being bombed. We need to try to understand why. Okay. And we cannot brush that under the carpet and pretend that there isn't a problem, no matter how much our media would like to. Okay. Irina, so, I mean, the electorate is divided. Even in London, large numbers of people think very differently from the way you do. So what steps are the Lib Dems taking to try and uh, to, to make inroads in those parts of London which didn't vote Remain? Well, I think we, we have moved on quite, quite a while um, from the original referendum. And indeed, a lot of people have changed their minds. They've changed their minds for good reason, of course, because we've seen what, what a mess this has created. And for London in particular, it is absolutely critical that people understand the direct link between our membership in the EU and their daily lives. Let me give you just one example, crime. London has been really uh, plagued by knife crime in, in recent months and weeks in particular. And, you know, I don't want my daughter to, to be scared to, to walk on the streets of London. Many people don't know how much European institutions like Europol, like the European Arrest Warrant, like Eurojust, have done really to make people's lives safer. We cannot really trace criminals without that vital cooperation between law enforcement agencies in the European Union. Okay, all right. And Richard, you know, there are some good points there, aren't there, about the cooperation that's necessary to deal with crime, but then also in a city like London, business, the way we trade, the way we work with people. Well, the knife crime point is very simple. Uh, politically correct policing has made uh, the police force re reduce very, very significantly the number of stop and searches that they do. Uh, and that is a license to criminals, uh, particularly in drug gangs, who wish to uh, carry lethal weapons of that kind. So that's something that is being solved, should be solved. And I'm afraid to say that uh, our, our mayor and our prime minister are both implicated in that very bad decision to reduce the number of stop and searches done by the police. OK, well, I think we're going to move over now. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. Um, guys, you know, you have uh, suffered, both parties, both of the, the two main parties have suffered in these local elections that we've just had. Um, you know, this isn't looking great for you, is it, Bob? No, clearly we, we're disappointed to see local elections going in a way where you see good, hard-working councillors losing their seats, quite frankly, probably nothing to do with their role as a councillor, more of a, a backlash against what's going on nationally. But it can't fill you with heart for these upcoming no. European elections. Well, no, I, I mean, clearly people are frustrated. I mean, the fact that we voted in 2016 to leave the European Union and then we're electing people to serve in the European Parliament three years later is bound to cause frustration. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm terribly frustrated that we can't get 
an arrangement whereby we leave the European Union, as we promised, get a deal with the European Union on trade and uh, the policing and other aspects, security, which is exactly what the Prime Minister has negotiated. Uh, if we can get that through Parliament and also make clear what our future trading arrangements are, I think then people will start to see not only the economic benefits of leaving the European Union, uh, but also the fact that it has been delivered and all the dire uh, promises and threats actually won't come to I mean, pass. Clearly your party is very divided and that is a hard sell uh, when it comes to elections. Mm. I mean, what can you do? We're only a few weeks out from the European elections. What can you do following on from these disastrous results in England well, I think to you, improve say, in the European elections? When you talk about disastrous, I think you must remember that the elections we've just looked at uh, uh, in the local elections were held in 2015, the same day as the general election, when we were on a very big high quite frankly, the Liberal Democrats were virtually wiped out across England and now there's been a recovery. Now, you know, we are getting a rebalancing of the position, which is reasonable and understandable. I feel very sorry for Conservative councillors. I, I served as a councillor for 24 years. I know what it's like to suffer these sort of uh, horrible uh, actions as a result of, not because of your action, but because of national politicians. Okay. Rashanara, thank you. I think that was a valiant attempt at positivity. Um, Rashanara, you are the party of opposition. In this situation, you should be clearing up. The locals have been very, very bad across England for Labour as well. Um, it's again, it is not the looking at the polling, it is not looking great for Labour either, is it? Well, w what the results show is that we've we've gained in some areas and lost in others. And it is a function, unfortunately, of an ambiguity to some extent about our position on Brexit. I would much rather our party was much more uh, straightforward now about uh, the fact that we should have a confirmatory vote on whatever the deal is that um, is is going to is the you know the Theresa May's deal um, versus the option to remain. I think that whether people voted to leave or remain, they should have the right to decide what that final uh, settlement is for our country. And I think as a party, it is time that we got off the fence and actually said it like it is and what we need as a for a for our country because that's what our voters want that's what the electorate want and we've partly suffered as a result of that ambiguity and I hope going forward we're going to be able to clarify that and make sure that we make the argument we take on UKIP I mean UKIP Richard talks about some of these points the points Richard's made UKIP is being by, advised by Tommy Robinson we've got to fight the fight of our lives Rish to, Rishnara, to win against we, parties that are dividing our country you, that are causing you, devastation we're not going to, we're not going so to this is this is a really now. important but, it, this yeah, really it is, matter for us but, but and it's about it's, standing up for labor values you standing talk up about for decency ambiguity. in our country you talk about ambiguity but you know, it, is there evidence that that is the problem, or it, or is it that actually, you know, you look at some of the polling data that actually people don't trust Jeremy Corbyn any more than they trust the Prime Minister? Well, I think there's there's huge concern and anger in the country. Absolutely, the country is divided over Brexit, and what's happening in, in happened in the government, the division within the government, the failure of Theresa May May to deal with this issue, to compromise. Uh, you know, okay. she's been in negotiation with my party for a very have, long we're time now. We're going to have to leave it there. Anywhere. Something about it. Okay. Your party could have stopped we're it. We're going to have to leave it there. Irina and Richard, thank you for coming in. Okay. And uh, next week we will be scrutinising the European elections offer from the Green Party and also Change UK. UK. And uh, you can find a full list of all the parties and candidates standing in the London European elections on the BBC London website, which will be at the address which should be appearing on your screens right about now. There it is. <laughs> right, now we are going to leave Brexit behind us for a short period of time. Whew, relief. And uh, we're going to talk about a campaign to create a new town council in Spitalfields and Banglatown in Tower Hamlets. The formation of a town council is supposed to give local people a greater voice in the democratic process. But some claim that this plan will create an island of privilege and divide the community. Bhavani Vadi reports. It's an area where change has been a constant, once home to the Huguenots, a Jewish community and more recently Bangladeshi residents. And with gentrification, it now boasts boutique shops, a thriving nightlife and hipster chic. Now some locals want to make a further change with the creation of a new hyper-local town council within the borough of Tower Hamlets.
We've done a massive amount of research. We know more about the local area than the local council does. We know what people want. We know what they're asking for, and we also know what they don't get through the current system. That's the difference. We have 12 people concentrating on this area, not concentrating on political positions, cabinet members and all that nonsense, actually concentrating on the area and the people who live here. The proposed new town council would serve around 8,000 residents living here in Spitalfields and Bangla Town. It would have limited powers to deal with issues like litter, bin collections, broken pavements and improving green spaces. Town or parish councils haven't existed in the capital for almost 80 years. This could be a model that could open up local democracy across London because the borough system has been in place now for 50 years and it, they are essentially impregnable castles that only the Labour Party and the Conservative Party and if you're very posh the Liberal Democrat Party can actually get into and honest altruistic people who just want to help their local neighbourhood and make things better are locked out. This is people from the neighbourhood saying, I care about this, I want to do something about it. Well, we it's care sorting about it. issues out rather than political expression. I mean, the point is that the political expression is getting in the way of sorting out the issues. Yeah, so, I would agree I, there. Yeah. Yeah. I think people in Tower Hamlets have had quite enough of political expression yeah. in the last few years. And in fact, you know, we live here, this is our home. And all we want to do is make our lives and have, and have better lives. A new town council for the area would be funded by a small precept on existing council tax and a percentage of money that property developers pay towards local improvements. But the idea is opposed by some Labour borough councillors. The promise is that if you set up a town council, you can do all of these things to support the community. Well, actually, town councils don't have the powers to do that. It sits with the borough council. So actually, you're putting an increase in council tax to be, do, to be able to do very few things locally. Queen's Park Community Council in Westminster is currently the only example of a town or parish council in London. So why aren't there more of this type of local council in the capital? Because it's extremely hard work to set up a council. It was a very long and slow process and they're the reasons I think they don't get set up. It should be made easier because, because they're worthwhile. They're, it's a really um, important thing to do. I mean, we bring in not far short of 200,000 a year to a very poor community, and that 200,000 pounds would not be here without us. Word on the streets of Spitalfields was broadly in favour. I think the smaller the community, the more the residents and those involved in the community can have an impact on it. But I think it would be a very good idea because it's going to bring the community together a way to kind of get the community involved in things on a smaller level which is a little bit more realistic. I think it'll work better for people. They won't feel so intimidated when they go to these big councils. So will a new local body give residents a greater voice or create another level of bureaucracy? Ultimately Tower Hamlets Borough Councillors will decide whether to have a new town council for this vibrant and distinct part of the capital. Well, joining us now is Professor Tony Travers from the London School of Economics. Thanks for coming in. Okay. Um, so is this a good idea then? We heard the lady from the Community Council in uh, Queen's Park saying it's fantastic. Well, I mean, remember Tower Hamlets has tried this kind of thing before. Under a previous administration, not that many years ago, uh, there were parish, uh, sort of community councils uh, across Tower Hamlets. And in the end, that was not, I think, seen as a great success. So it is worth remembering that history. Beyond that, and the point came up in Queen's Park, there's a lot of effort required. I mean, you need lots of people to put in a lot of time. You've got to make things work. You know, the, if you're running a council with money, you've got to have officials, you've got to have proper meetings, you've got to have, the whole thing has to be done in a business-like way. So it's not like setting up a sort of civic society, wonderful though they are, it's rather more formal than that and it then requires an enormous amount of commitment and you've got to get people out to vote of course, we've had local elections in the past week, turnouts are not massively high in those so you've got to really work to get people out so I think it's, it, there's, there's a lot of work here. So does that feed into what Bhavani was talking about which is the fact that this can be 
you know, it's sort of self-selecting by the very nature of it because some people don't have the time to take part in this kind of thing. They don't have the finances to be running around and taking part in these community activities. And so it can be divisive in a community. There's always that risk because some people in any part of London will have more time, more interest, more wherewithal to be able to do all these things and work with the system to set it up. And there is a risk, therefore, some areas would be seen as privileged and others less able to do that would feel left behind and that would re then require the council to try to even out so it, it, it is kind of difficult it's worth remembering however of course parishes were existed all over London in the distant past and they're the <laughs> basis of the government we have today Indeed. through several iterations back to the future there we are Roshanara this is sort of in your patch isn't it so what do you think well what I would say is that Tower Hamlets has historically had the experience of working together across different communities and when communities have come together white middle class people with white working class and ethnic minority communities we've been strong in dealing with the issues that affect the area when people have pulled apart we become divided and the neighborhood system that the Liberal Democrats introduced was so da dangerous and divisive it ushered in the first British National pa Party mm -hmm. councillor in my borough when I was a teenager it was a total disaster and I think that those who have legitimate concerns and are campaigning for this parish council need to remember the dangerous history of decentralization and focus on how we can work together influence the council to get things right where they're frustrated about antisocial behavior and I those issues rather than creating more division and potentially a dangerous Watch process of segregation. To Tony, I, we can't have you here and not talk about the local elections in uh, other parts of England. Um, you know, not great results for either Labour or the Conservatives, no. putting it mildly. Um, what does this tell us ahead of the European elections? Well, it tells us that the long -term, there's a long-term decline in Conservative plus Labour voting. It's been going on since 1950s, really, with, with periodic reversals. And we're seeing a significant fragmentation here, clearly aided and abetted by people being aggravated by Brexit appearing to go nowhere and sort of chaos at Parliament and all of that. So against that backdrop, we've seen a fragmentation. But of course, these were traditional first-past-the-post elections, once we get into the European elections, they are by proportional representation, and that makes fragmentation much easier. And, of course, the Brexit Party and Change UK will be fighting those elections, and I think they will take the even more votes from the two so big parties. So you think parties. it'll be even worse for them? I suspect so, because it's an encouragement to uh, people to vote as they feel rather than as they tribally used to, and that, that, that's, that's a longer-term change. It's quite bad for you, isn't it? Well, you saw the opinion polls that uh, existed in the, in, uh, recently in London to, to demonstrate well, that the, the Brexit party from nothing has suddenly leapt to, the, to be the most popular party without any policies, without anything other than one personality. And so a lot of the, the reality of this is that elections that we shouldn't be having, of course, the public are going to be upset about them and they're going to use them, I'm afraid, to protest. And I'm, you know, I frankly, I don't blame them for okay. being frustrated. There we are. Well, we end on frustration. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all we have time for this week. Thanks to Tony and, of course, to Rushnara and to Bob. And thank you for watching. I do hope you can join us again at the same time next week. Enjoy the rest of your bank holiday weekend. Goodbye for now.